We had presentation of the charter today, and this is the presentation of our Lord. Uh, we are here today talking about um, the way in which the scouting movement, which is one of the very first missions of this congregation when it was formed uh, 55 years ago, has shaped the lives of many of us. I had you raise hands there, you can see uh, how that shaping has taken place. Uh, there's a text in the Old Testament that I want to read, which is going to be the basis for some of my remarks today, which comes from the prophet Micah. It was uh, written in the 8th century, uh, around the time of the destruction of the northern kingdom. Uh, and it was uh, Micah asking and answering the question, uh, how shall we present ourselves to the temple? Micah writes with, what shall I present myself to the Lord? Shall I bow down before God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with a young calf? Will the Lord take delight in a thousand rams, in ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn child for all of my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, old man, what is good. What, the, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God? The most successful advertising campaign of all time is just three words. Just do it. The campaign was fueled by the style, the grace, the commitment, and the disciplined life of one pro basketball player, Michael Jordan. And uh, he made that little swoop there, Nike, a household word about 20, 25 years ago. Now the premise of the campaign was frankly a provocative, namely, y'all know what you want to be. Y'all know what you want to do, and y'all know what you need to do to get there. The problem is having the willingness to refocus your life to do what's necessary, to uh, run faster, to lift weights, to lose 50 pounds or more, uh, to stop drinking, to change your job, to uh, go back to school, to buy a $300 pair of sneakers. I don't know, you know. <laughs> Whatever that might be, just do it, the campaign said. Just do it. A simple and authentic word. And I think we all hunger for simple and authentic words these days. That's why recently, when we lost Kobe Bryant, who was kind of the new image for, uh, for Nike, it became such a, a loss to so many people because uh, in spite of his problems, he was a person of authenticity. People liked what he did, for the most part. But see, here's the problem, and I think that some of these scouters here can, can relate to this, and I know the scouts can. To be involved in the kind of commitment it requires to shape your values with commitment, is like swimming upstream like a salmon. Because there's a contrary dynamic at work in our world right now, in case you haven't noticed. And that's a dynamic that wants to do things the easy way. To find the shortcuts. To shade the truth. Uh, it's on display everywhere all the time. These young people who are in scout uniforms will tell you, it ain't easy. Schools and organizations and families, they all, there are all kinds of things out there that want to pull you in different directions and beg for your commitments to find the right ones that will help shape you into a full-fledged, functioning, authentic adult, those are not easy to find. This cultural dynamic is on full display right now, and I'm not talking about the impeachment. That's a topic perhaps for another day, another sermon, not this one. What I'm talking about is this, this thing right here. This is an electronic keyboard. This allows any schlep to sit down and push a button and play a classic tune by Bach or Beethoven without knowing a single note of music. And for someone who spent the first 15 years of their lives doing piano lessons, that just chaps my backside. <laughs> There's an old joke, it's so old that I actually heard it told on a rerun of Perry Mason recently, about a tourist on his way to a concert at Carnegie Hall who gets lost. The man replies, uh, sees a man with a violin case and says, hey, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And of course the man replies, practice baby, lots and lots of practice. <laughs> Yeah, see, it's not that old after all. Uh, good musicians all are born with a gift, but good music requires lots and lots of practice. Or maybe you thought the music program in this place happens by accident, by some happy confluence of having a bunch of gifted people who can just walk in and do it. Uh -uh. Lots and lots of practice. Without discipline, the gift doesn't really amount to much. Now, I grew up in a home where I was expected to be involved in school activities and in Boy Scouts and in, and in sports, but I also had to play the piano. And I couldn't do the first 
or the second thing, or the third or fourth thing, until I'd done the first thing, practice the piano. So every day, 30 minutes, I had to practice the piano. My mother would set one of those god-awful little white kitchen timers, which still sets my, my teeth on edge, and she'd go away. Now, I, I learned that I could stop you know, from between pieces and go up and set it ahead five minutes, and, <laughs> but that didn't really help much. My mother had a rule, you don't have to practice the piano every day, just the days that you want to eat. <laughs> just do it. That was her comment. With what shall I present myself to the Lord? That's perhaps the best question the Bible ever asked. And, and by the way, it's not just an Old uh, Testament question by an 8th century prophet named Micah. It's a question that Jesus fielded several times in the New Testament. How, how can I be saved? What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to have life and have life in abundance? What must I do? Well, today the prophet Micah presents a list. He begins it with a big hyperbolic list of the things we might want to do. Well, a simple bow of the head do it, you know, kind of a, an occasional trip to church. You know, Christmas, Easter, maybe a couple more times during the year. Will that do? How about a burnt offering, a calf? Hey, that's a nice offering. You ever went and smelled a steak on the grill? That's a nice offering. It smells good. How about a thousand rams from a person who's got real resources and means? Or, or perhaps 10,000 rivers of olive oil from a king? Will those things be enough? All right, how about this? How about your firstborn, your only begotten son? How about that? Will that get God's attention? Will that will give God the ultimate proof of my authenticity and my desire to get right with God? Will that work? Because that's how religion worked. 2,800 years ago, by the way, that's how it still works today in some places, in some contexts. Religion was practiced by the neighbors of Israel all around as ritual sacrifices meant to appease their gods. What shall I come with to the Lord? How shall I present myself? Well, Micah suggests that all of that stuff that is listed misses the point. Oh, Israel, he has told you what is good. You know what the Lord requires of you. Do justice. Love mercy, walk humbly, just do it. It's a call to integrity. It says, walk the walk, don't just talk the talk. It's a consistent theme for the Old and the New Testament. It's about what the scouting movement is about, doing what you say you will do and making a difference in the world. The prophet Amos wrote, I hate your feasts. I despise your solemn assemblies. I dislike your burnt offerings and your songs. Just let justice roll down like righteousness, like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And Jesus put it this way to, to Peter on the last day they were ever together. If you love me, Peter, feed my sheep, tend my lambs, love my flock. Just do it. It does not take a genius to understand that religious ceremony and worship that is divorced from acts of mercy is just an empty, irrelevant gesture. And it explains why so many churches sit empty these days. We've learned that here, and with anything we can share with a larger church, this is it. When we ask new members why they decide to come here, why after maybe years of living on the margins of spirituality, they decide they're going to come here and affirm their faith in Jesus, you know what? Their answers almost always have something to do with authenticity. Something like, you here don't just talk the talk, you walk the walk. And that matters. It matters. Because your faith isn't just about you. It's not just about God. It's about the world in which God has sent you to be his sacrament. And most of us come from generations that have had labels attached. Boomers, busters, Generation X, millennials. We have all tried to work this the world's way. We've adopted materialism. We've all come up short. We have immersed ourselves as a culture in this incredibly profitable and opportunistic economy. I have made more money in the last five years than I've made in the previous 60. I am living a lifestyle beyond my wildest dreams. But at the end of every day, I ask, and I suspect you do too, what does the Lord require of me? And Micah's answer is clear. You know what the Lord requires of you. Do justice. This is a very uncomfortable topic for us. Let's be honest. Our politics always want to get in the way of this topic. We allow the world to speak loudly and often, and we don't listen to the voice of God. 
but it's a persistent biblical theme. And God speaks loudly. He is not just interested in justice. He is determined to deal compassionately with the poor and the marginalized and the outcast and the needy and persons for whom he holds special attention. This is what we are here to do. Justice. Remember, most of us were not earning ourselves into our position. We are born into it. We were born into families and situations that gave us unprecedented access to power and privilege and success denied others simply because they were not born into these areas of privilege. We didn't earn what we have. It has nothing to do with our intelligence or our ability or our gumption. I was born into a family where my parents instilled in me values and discipline and aspirations and took me to church and encouraged me to be in scouts and to be in all the right places and forced me to read the books and practice the piano and taught me the value of the word of God and insisted that I brush my teeth and stand up straight and say please and thank you and not talk with my mouth full and put my knife down before I pick my fork up. I was never turned away from anything because of my skin color or my address, or my family heritage. But I know this is not true for millions of people who live in the same culture and society as I, even some of my neighbors. This is just not true. People are challenged. God's people are challenged to challenge and engage the powers and principalities of this world, to challenge inequality. And when we do that, it makes us nervous, as it should, because it's like wearing those scout uniforms to school. You are swimming upstream like a salmon. But according to Micah, this is what God requires us. Do justice. Just do it. And that may mean providing, providing shelter for the homeless who sleep at the doors of our public buildings to act against the systemic reasons for poverty and the unprecedented uh, underclass of the unemployed and the sick in this time of wealth to speak a word to, uh, for them to the political powers and the economic interests that exist and ignore them because they don't vote and they don't buy. Those values are not the values of Jesus Christ. So are you ready to espouse those values? Because that's what God requires. Do justice. Just do it. And love mercy. Old Testament word here is chesed. It means everlasting love. It describes who God is, what God does. Do you love mercy? It's hard. Not in my experience do many people love mercy. We love fairness. We like to balance accounts. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That suits as well. But Micah says that God desires mercy because getting what you deserve is fair. But getting what you don't deserve, like forgiveness and mercy, that's not fair at all. But that's what God does, because God is a God of mercy. And to love that God is to love what that God loves, mercy. Not to understand it, not to like it, but to love it. Just do it. And the hardest of all, to walk home. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus spoke a remarkable series of statements we call the Beatitudes. The word in Greek, that is beatitude is makarios, which means blessed, but it can also be translated as fortunate. We've grown accustomed to hearing the traditional translation, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful. But the statements change character when you read them with another translation. How fortunate are the poor in spirit? How fortunate are the meek? How fortunate are the merciful? Because in a time of shaded truths, we yearn for authenticity. We yearn for balance. We yearn for something that matters. We yearn to know the answer to the question, what must we do? At the end of the day, we all yearn to be blessed. But I've also discovered this hard truth that peace and happiness, they're something that are elusive and desperate when you're pursuing them. And the harder you try to get something you don't have, the more frustrating it is when you don't have it. So here, this last requirement for me resonates to walk humbly with God, to just do it, because peace is a gift of God's grace. And it's usually given to you, not when you're asking for it or looking for it, but when you least expect it, when you're doing something in the name of and for the sake of Jesus Christ. Malcolm Muggeridge is a name you might remember from, from years back. He was a famous BBC correspondent who for most of his life was what you might call an indifferent agnostic. But near the end of his life, 
He was sent on an assignment to India to interview Mother Teresa and her order of the Sisters of Charity. Their mission was to care for the dying in the streets of, Al of Calcutta. He left for that uh, interview an indifferent agnostic. He came back a committed Catholic, committed Christian. The work that Mother Teresa and her order did is about as bad as work gets. The poverty they dealt with is unlike anything you or I have ever seen. The, the sick and the dying lay in the streets and the gutters of, of Calcutta, thousands, millions, begging for food waiting to die. And Mother Teresa and her sisters would get up every morning and say their prayers and then walk out amongst them to minister to them. As space allowed, they would literally, these little old ladies literally would carry the dying back to their convent. They would bathe them and feed them and give them a clean bed in which to die in view of a loving face. That's the way Mother Teresa put it. It was grim and morbid work. But what floored Malcolm Muggeridge, and eventually what lured him back to a simple and unshakable faith in Jesus Christ, was the reality that Mother Teresa and the Sisters of Mercy were never grim and never morbid. They were always radiantly happy. And it's not because they set out each day seeking happiness. It's because they began each day by giving it to Jesus, and then doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with their God. And in doing that, they discovered that they were the most fortunate of God's children, that they were blessed beyond words. How fortunate are the poor in spirit, because they know they own nothing that will get in the way of their relationship to God. How fortunate are those who mourn, because they loved enough to risk breaking their hearts and to make themselves vulnerable for the sake of love. How fortunate are those who hunger for righteousness and truth and beauty because in weakness they will find strength and in despair they will find hope and in death they will find life. With what shall we come to the Lord? What does the Lord require of us? He has told you, O people of God, in Jesus he has shown you, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly, just do it and you will be blessed. To God be the glory. Amen.